Hello and welcome to Access Asia. I'm Charles Pellegrin. Coming up, Beijing is hosting the Winter Olympics, but does this mean a winter sports culture will stay once the Olympians go home? Our reporters in China tried to find out. And just as the games are in full swing, Peng Shui speaks to Western media for the first time since she accused a high-ranking Chinese official of sexual assault. She says it was all a huge misunderstanding. And finally, a country has lost its voice. Lata Mangeshkar, also known as India's Nightingale, passed away at age 92, leaving behind her a treasure trove of Bollywood songs. Well, let's start off this week in China, where all eyes are set on the ongoing Winter Olympic Games. The events have come under scrutiny for a number of different reasons beyond sport. But these games are also the culmination of an impressive campaign to convert over 300 million people into winter sport aficionados. Our correspondents in China went to Yanqing District near Beijing to meet some of those who are now used to putting on their skis and hitting the slopes. By their own account, they'd much rather be skiing than working the land. The team is called the Yanqing Peasant Skiers. They are farmers trained and equipped by the local authorities. The team's captain, Lang Enge, is a farmer turned ski teacher. And he's very proud the Olympics are taking place in his backyard. <laughs> The aim of the authorities was to make skiers of the local population, but there's no off piste here. In these barren mountains, it rarely snows. The Olympic slopes just a few miles from here have been made possible by snow brought from elsewhere. Some estimates say two million meters cubed of water are required to cover them with snow, the equivalent of 800 Olympic swimming pools. Beijing's reservoirs have been pressed into action to provide the water, but the Chinese government is at pains to point out the games are environmentally friendly and despite dry conditions, ski tourism is beginning to take off. This group of friends are looking for lodgings closer to the Olympics for the holidays. Ni Yi Pin has renovated about a hundred lodges like this one across the region. All are booked out during the games, and he's hoping it lasts. The hope is these Olympics will be a springboard for winter sports in China. Official figures say there are already 300 million people taking part. So let's uh, delve a little deeper here and speak to an expert on sport in China, someone with both academic and athletic credentials. That's uh, Susan Brownell. She's a professor of anthropology at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. She was also a nationally ranked track and field athlete in the U.S. before she joined the track team at Beijing University in the mid-1980s. So thank you so much uh, for joining us here on France 24. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So we've, uh, we've seen a huge uh, winter sport infrastructure buildup over the last few years. The organizing committee of the Olympics says that since 2015, over 450 ice rinks have been built, as well as 300 uh, snow resorts, and close to $94 billion in revenue were generated by the winter sports industry in 2020. So would you say that China's reached its goal of becoming a winter sports country? Well, I think it has built the basic infrastructure it needs to become a winter sports country. Uh, you know, most of China is actually pretty cold and and has snow and ice. And so there actually was already a pretty wide participation base in skating in particular, because people could skate on lakes and uh, to a lesser extent skiing. But, uh, you know, there were people in the Northeast who grew up skiing. It, it's just that now they're, you know, building it up into a system that will produce competitive athletes.
And, and is the aim here purely economic? Is it just about uh, finding new ways for the country's growing upper middle class and, and, and richer class to spend its money? Uh, or is there uh, something else going on here? I don't think the goal is necessary to generate necessarily to generate more money, but it's to keep them happy because there has been such criticism for several, um, a couple of decades now that economic development was pursued at the cost of quality of life um, and pollution was mentioned as one of the big um, pieces of collateral damage. So now the party is spending more um, time and effort and money on trying to improve the quality of life of the citizenry. So I think winter sports is part of that effort. And is there not a, a political dimension to this, a, a soft power push to, to give a certain image of China around the world? Like, how, how do you account for that uh, aspect? Yeah, there's also a soft power image to hosting mega events and also um, perhaps to showing that China has reached the point of prosperity that it can support this uh, sort of après ski culture that exists um, in Europe and North America, where um, which is patronized by wealthy elites. So I think ski, skiing in particular has that um, symbolism in, in East Asia and in China. And so, you know, demonstrating that China uh, can now support that sort of elite leisure culture has its appeal as well. We'll have to move on to a different topic now because there's one topic that's uh, sparked a lot of discussion ahead of the games, and that was that of, of Peng Shui. As a reminder, uh, the tennis uh, Chinese uh, champion said in a social media post that she had been forced to having sex with a high-ranking government official. This post was quickly taken offline, and then Peng disappeared from public life, and this led to a, a global campaign inquiring about her well-being and, and, and whereabouts. Well, after a string of, of tightly controlled public appearances, the, the tennis champion spoke uh, to French Sports Daily, L'Equipe, uh, again, in a, in a vi very tightly controlled setting. Um, let's hear what she had to say in that interview, and, and then we'll get your reaction on this, uh, on this latest development. I never said anyone had sexually assaulted me in any way. I never disappeared. It's just that so many people, like my friends or people from the IOC, messaged me, and it was simply impossible to answer so many messages. So, Professor Brownell, uh, Peng Shui also announced her retirement from professional tennis in the same interview. What do you make of this interview? Should we take this uh, at face value? I think we may never know the real story behind Peng Shui, but I will say that I, I cannot recall a case of an athlete being detained um, at all, ever. Um, maybe I'm missing something. So I do think it would have been unusual if she had been sort of detained, pressured, and brainwashed while she was in detention, which is the worst that people have imagined. And I think we all know it's not unusual that a woman makes an accusation, which probably is correct, and but then retracts it when it goes public and she feels a sense of shame about what has happened. And that certainly is the case in China, where something like this would be regarded um, with the, Chin uh, the Chinese proverb, uh, which means uh, family shame should not be made public. Um, I will say that Chinese high officials are known for being um, sexually you know, corrupt, and the Communist Party is actually pretty conservative and prudish on that point. And so um, cracking down on the patronization of prostitutes and the um, support of uh, what they call second wives has actually been a policy of the Communist Party going on for decades. So I don't think the Communist Party would regard this favorably to know that a member of the Politburo had had an affair. And um, so, uh, I mean, behind the scenes, I, I think that uh, the person himself could be in trouble. But, you know, in the end, we may never really know what, what happened behind the scenes. Professor Susan Brownell, thank you so much uh, for that interview. And uh, we'll move on now to the rest uh, of the show. Uh, India's emblematic singer Lata Mangeshkar, known by millions as the Nightingale of India, died on Sunday at the age of 92. She'd spent the past few weeks in an intensive care unit in her native Mumbai, suffering from COVID-19 symptoms. Her instantly recognizable songs were a permanent feature of Bollywood since the 1940s and heard in more than a thousand films. She came to symbolize the voice of a nation. James Mulholland tells us more. 
The voice of Bollywood and the soul of Indian music. Lata Mangeshkar's songs have touched the hearts of millions of Indians over eight decades. She made her name in Bollywood in the 1940s, recording her first feature song at the age of just 13. Her high-pitched and unique melodies conveyed a range of emotions that still speak to Indians today. I grew up with her song only. My parents are a hardcore fan of her. Goosebumps are coming. We cannot believe that she is no more with us. There was such a sweetness in her voice. It touched your soul every time she sang. Prime Minister Narendra Modi led tributes for the singer, known as the Nightingale of India. She may not be present physically amongst us, but her voice and her love will always be present. Born in 1929 in pre-independence India, Mangeshka began singing as a child, taught by her father. For decades, hers was the voice of choice for the lavish musicals, with generations of leading ladies lip-syncing along to Lata Mangeshka. Her songs transcended religion, politics and social issues. With her debut release in 1942, her popularity preceded the split between India and Pakistan and continues to reach across the divide. Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan was among the first to praise one of the truly great singers the world has known. One of the most recorded artists in history, estimates of her back catalogue range from 15,000 to as many as 30,000 songs in some 30 languages. Well, that's all for Access Asia this week, but do stay tuned for more programming on France 24. Thanks for watching.